Section 7 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gray Clayton. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Section 7. Chapter 7. The Beautiful Patient. Ten minutes had scarcely elapsed since Lord Ellingham took his departure from the doctor's abode, and the learned gentleman himself was still pondering on the strange communication which had been made to him, when a loud and hasty knock at the front door echoed through the house. A servant answered the summons, and in a few moments ushered Tom Rain into the presence of Dr. Lassells. Sir, said the visitor, who was painfully excited, a female, a young woman in whom I am deeply interested, has taken poison. Come with me this instant, I implore you. Dr. Lassell snatched up his hat and followed Rainford without pausing to ask a single question. A hackney coach was waiting at the door, the two individuals leapt in, and the vehicle drove rapidly away. The doctor now thought it expedient to make a few inquiries relative to the case which was about to engage his attention. "'What poison has the young woman taken?' he asked. "'Arsenic,' was the reply, for I found the paper which had contained it. "'And how long ago? Ten minutes before I knocked at your door. Has there been any vomiting?' "'I did not delay a single moment in hastening to fetch you after the unhappy creature took the poison.' and therefore i am unable to answer that question the physician remained silent and in a few minutes the coach stopped at a house in south milton street the door was opened by a servant girl and rainford led the physician to a bedroom on the second floor whither the servant girl followed them by the light of a candle placed upon a chest of drawers dr lassells beheld a young female of great beauty and with no other garment on than her nightdress, writhing in excruciating agonies upon the bed. From the reply given by the servant girl to a question put by the doctor, it appeared that the young lady had been seized with violent vomiting the moment after Tom Rain had left to procure medical aid, and Lassells accordingly proceeded to adopt the usual treatment which is pursued in such cases. Footnote 1 the first great object which we must keep in view is to promote the speedy evacuation of the stomach if the poison itself has not produced vomiting from ten to twenty grains of sulphate of zinc must be given if it can be readily procured this generally acts as a powerful emetic if this however cannot be obtained a mustard emetic should be administered and the vomiting promoted by drinking large quantities of barley water, linseed tea, milk, or tepid water. The two first, being of a mucilaginous nature, are to be preferred. Tickling the back of the throat with a feather will often cause the stomach to reject its contents. It frequently happens that this treatment alone is sufficient for relief in accidents of this nature. After the stomach has been cleansed by the emetic and so on, as described above, lime water or chalk diffused in water if it can be procured may be given in large quantities hahnemann has recommended soap to be dissolved in water in the proportion of a pound to four pints and a teacupful to be given every five or six minutes this undoubtedly is the best treatment if lime water is not at hand powdered charcoal may also be administered with advantage if the other remedies are not immediately attainable the above remedies may be used with some degree of confidence, although their good effects are not sufficiently certain to establish them as antidotes. From Ready Remedies in Cases of Poisoning, etc., by James Johnson, M.R.C.S. End of footnote 1. In the course of half an hour, the patient was pronounced to be out of danger, and Tom Rain who had in the meantime manifested the most utmost anxiety and uneasiness, now exhibited a proportionate liveliness of joy. "'Shall I recover, sir? Oh, tell me, shall I recover?' 
asked the young woman in a strange thrilling piteous tone as she fixed her large dark eyes upon the countenance of the physician you are in a fair way to survive this mad this wicked attempt on your life answered lassels in a compassionately reproachful rather than a severe tone but you must be kept quiet and all sources of mental irritation must be removed or forgotten as much as possible he added glancing towards rainford oh sir do not imagine for a moment that he will upbraid or ill-treat me exclaimed the young woman darting a fond look towards tom rain then drawing a long and heavy respiration she said in a different and more subdued tone in justice to him doctor i must assure you that no harshness on his part urged me to this shocking deed but yes my dearest girl interrupted rain rushing to the bed and taking one of her hands which he pressed fondly to his lips i did upbraid you i did speak severely to you no no not more than i deserved cried the young woman for i was very wrong oh i was very wrong but say tom can you forgive me he does forgive you he has forgiven you exclaimed the physician and now abandon that subject which is naturally a painful one to-morrow morning i shall call and see you early dr lassells took up his hat to depart and rainford followed him into the passage where he said in a low but earnest tone one word sir in private please to step into this room and he conducted the physician into a front apartment the door of which he carefully closed in the first place sir began rainford when they were thus alone together allow me to thank you for your prompt and effectual aid in this most painful affair and he slipped five guineas into the doctor's hand second let me implore of you to grant the favour which i am about to ask speak sir said lassells and if your request be not inconsistent with my honour as a physician and a gentleman far from it exclaimed rainford it is this promise me on your solemn word of honour as a physician and as a gentleman that when once your professional visits here have ceased you will forget that you ever beheld that young woman who is lying in the next room promise me i say in the most binding manner that should you ever henceforth meet her alone or in company you will not even appear to recognise her much less attempt to speak to her unless you be formally introduced to her when you will consider your acquaintance with her to begin only from the moment of such introduction promise me all this sir i implore you for you know not what vitally important interest may be compromised by your conduct in this manner i have not the slightest objection to tranquillize your mind by giving the pledge which you demand returned dr lassells without a moment's hesitation a thousand thanks sir cried rainford joyfully you fully understand the precise nature of the reserve and silence which i require never to allude in any way to the incident of this night nor to appear to recognize elsewhere nor henceforth the young lady whom i have just seen said the doctor you may rely upon me the secret shall never transpire from my lips again i express my gratitude cried rainford with undisguised satisfaction dr lassells then took his leave and as he retraced his way to grafton street he never once ceased to think of the strange promise which he had been required to give in respect to the beautiful creature who had made so resolute an attempt upon her own existence on the following morning shortly after eight o'clock the physician's cab stopped at the door of the house in south milton street but to his surprise he learnt from the landlady that mr and mrs jameson by which names rainford and the young woman had been known at their lodgings had taken their departure at seven o'clock before it was even light had they resided long with you inquired the doctor only a week sir was the answer the lady kept herself very quiet and seldom went out when she did she always had a thick black veil over her face and you may think it strange sir but it's true for all that which is sir that i never once caught a glimpse of her countenance all the time she was in this house but the servant gal says she was very beautiful very beautiful indeed you must however be able to judge whether that report is true or not sir i know little and i think less of those matters my good woman said the doctor hastily 
and returning to his cab he drove off to visit another patient end of section seven recording by gray clayton section eight of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gray Clayson. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds, Section 8. Chapter 8. Seven Dials. There is not in all London a more extraordinary locality than that which bears the denomination of Seven Dials. Situate in the midst of one of the lowest and worst neighbourhoods throughout the metropolis, and forming a focus where seven streets converging towards that point meet like as many streams flowing into a common reservoir the open spot of ground called seven dials is a lounge for all the idle vagabonds and ill-looking persons men and women who occupy the cellars and garrets in the vicinity from the centre of the open space alluded to the eyes may plunge their glances down into the circumjacent thoroughfares, narrow, dark, filthy, and formed by dwellings of an appearance so miserable or so repulsive that they equally pain the heart and shock the sight. If the wanderer amidst the mazes of this vast city were desired to point out the chosen abode of poverty and crime, taking as his guide the physical aspect of all the worst neighbourhoods, he would probably indicate seven dials and its branching streets. The shops are all of the lowest and dirtiest description. Nauseous odours impregnate the atmosphere. In winter the streets are knee-deep in mud, save when hardened by the frost, and in summer they are strewed with the putrefying remnants of vegetables, offal, and filth of every description. Half-naked children paddle about in the mire, or wallow on the heaps of decomposing substances just alluded to, greedily devouring the parings of turnips and carrots, sucking the marrow out of the rotting bones, and rejoicing when they happen to find a mouldy crust, a morsel of putrid meat, or the maggot-eaten head of a fish. Neglected beings, too, are they, knowing nothing save blows, curses, and hunger at home, and learning naught save every corrupt habit and ruinous vice abroad. How can we be surprised if such an infancy becomes imbued with those evil principles which jails and treadmills only tend afterwards to confirm, and which give ample promise of occupation for turnkeys, penal settlements, and the hangman? The established church is maintained at an annual expense of several millions sterling, the clergy belonging to that church claim the right of educating and instructing the people, and yet in no country in the civilized world is there such an appalling amount of juvenile depravity as in England. For ourselves, we declare, we repeat, that our government, our legislature, our clergy, and our great landowners are all guilty of the blackest turpitude in permitting hundreds of thousands, I millions of children, to be neglected in so horrible a manner. If a child be seized with a malignant, infectious, and dangerous disease, what will be said of the father who looked on indifferently, who omitted to call in medical advice, and who beheld with equal calmness the furious malady spreading amongst the rest of his offspring? Should we not denounce? Should we not execrate such a man as a monster deserving of any penalty which our statutes could inflict? yes a thousand times yes by a parity of reasoning then do we hold up to abhorrence those men who seize upon the reins of power merely to gratify their own selfish ambition also those men who accept seats in the legislative assemblies and fritter away the time of a great nation in their own party squabbles those men too who put on black gowns preach sermons as a duty rendered in return for the enjoyment of enormous revenues, 
and then declaim against the wickedness of those millions whom they do not attempt to reform and lastly those men who wring the sweat from the poor man's brow to distil pearls for themselves but who care not for the welfare of that poor man's offspring hundreds of thousands of pounds are annually subscribed to further the objects of foreign missions the scene of whose labours is in far-off lands scarcely known to us by name and amongst a race with whom our sympathies cannot exist but beneath our very eyes crossing our paths constantly displaying their loathsome rags to our view are small children innumerable whose only training is for the prison the hulks and the gallows talk not to us of christianizing barbarians in the remote islands of the south seas when the children of so many of our own fellow countrymen and countrywomen are but barbarous christians at home let the reader who imagines that we exaggerate the amount of the evil we denounce let him take his stand any evening in the midst of seven dials and well consider the scenes around him it is said that there are seven cardinal sins at the point where we would wish our sceptical reader to post himself he may command a view of seven streets each one presenting to his contemplation some new phase in the common sphere of hideous poverty and terrible demoralization mark the population of that neighborhood consisting of seven streets with all their connecting lanes and alleys with their dark filthy courts and their murderous looking nooks and passages of what does this population consist men brutalized by drink or rendered desperate by poverty and in either state ready to commit a crime women of squalid wasted and miserable appearance who being beaten by their husbands and fathers revenge themselves upon their children or their little brothers and sisters poor shopkeepers who endeavour to make up for the penury of their petty dealings by cheating their famished customers wretched boys and girls whose growth is stunted by suffering whose forms are attenuated through want and whose minds are poisoned by the scenes of vice dissipation and immorality which open upon them at their very birth what hope what promise for the future do such beings as these hold out in consternation and sorrow mingled with the most awful misgivings do we survey the picture which we are now compelled to draw and our feelings are thus painful because we know this picture to be correct and yet we call our country merry england merciful heavens what a mockery is this name can england be merry while the most hideous poverty is the lot of half her population while her workhouses are crowded with miserable beings who must for ever resign all hope or idea of again enjoying the comforts of home while the streets are filled with loathsome wretches clad in filthy rags which barely cover them shivering with the cold or fainting beneath the intolerable heat and spurned from the doors not only of the rich but also of the very officers appointed to relieve distress while the poor mother maddened with the idea of her own destitution and houseless condition presses her famishing child to her breast which yields no milk and then rushes in desperation to consign the innocent being to the waters of the nearest stream while the wretched father stifles his children that he may hush for ever in their throats the cry of bread bread that vain and useless cry to which he cannot respond while innocent babes and prattling infants bear upon their countenances and exhibit in their attenuated frames all the traces of the dread and agonizing pangs of a constant gnawing craving never satisfied hunger and while hundreds annually die around us of starvation and absolute want merry england indeed what is england joyous when the shop of the pawnbroker thrives royally upon the immense interest wrung from the very vitals of the poor when the jails the hospitals and the workhouses are more numerous than the churches 
when the hulks are swarming with convicts pent up in frightful floating dungeons amidst a fetid atmosphere when the streets throng with unfortunate girls who ask to be redeemed from an appalling traffic but see no avenue of escape from their loathsome calling when the voice of starvation the voice of crime the voice of discontent and the voice of barbarian ignorance echo up to heaven and form such a chorus as could scarcely be expected to meet the ears beyond the precinct of hell and when seven-tenths of the entire population are wretched oppressed enslaved trampled upon miserable degraded demoralized merry england but let us continue the thread of our narrative two of the thoroughfares which converge to seven dials bear each the name of earl street passing from high street st giles towards st martin's lane we must request the reader to turn with us to the right into that earl street which lies between the dials and one extremity of monmouth street halfway up earl street stood a house of even a darker and more gloomy appearance than its companion its doorway was lower than the level of the street and was reached by descending three steps the windows were small and as many of the panes were broken the holes were mended with pieces of dirty paper or stopped up with old rags altogether there was something so poverty-stricken and yet so sinister about the appearance of that tottering dingy repulsive-looking dwelling that no one possessing an article of jewellery about his person or having gold in his pocket would have chosen to venture amongst its inmates and who were those inmates the neighbours scarcely knew certain it was however that over the rickety door of the house were painted the words tobias bunce tailor but few were the jobs which mr bunce ever obtained from the inhabitants in the vicinity for his manners were too reserved too repulsive to gain favour with the class of persons who might have patronised him and yet there appeared to be no signs of absolute poverty in that dwelling mrs bunce was one of the adjacent butcher's best customers a public house in the dials was known to be regularly visited by her for the beer at dinner and supper times and the pints of gin were occasionally purchased by the same mysterious customer at the same establishment she was as averse to gossiping as her husband and her neighbours declared that they could not make her out at all she always paid ready money for everything she had and therefore the tradespeople were the staunch defenders of the bunces whenever a word of suspicion was uttered against them who then were these bunces let us step inside their dwelling and see if we can ascertain it was about eight o'clock in the evening a few days after the incidents related in the preceding chapters that toby bunce his wife old death and the lad jacob sat down to tea in the ground floor back room of the house which we have been describing toby bunce was a short thin pale-faced sneaking-looking man of about forty he was dressed in a suit of very shabby black and his linen was not remarkable for cleanliness his coarse brown hair was suffered to grow to a considerable length and as he seldom treated it to an acquaintance with the comb it hung in matted curls over his shoulders his nails were equally neglected and resembled claws terminating with blackened points his better half as mrs bunce indeed was not only figuratively but also literally was a tall thin scraggy lantern-faced woman with a sharp green eye a vixenous pug nose and a querulous voice for although she was excessively reserved when she went out to do her marketing she made up for that silence abroad by an extra amount of garrulity at home her age exceeded by a year or two that of her husband and as she was totally devoid of that sentiment which is so generally ascribed to the sex we mean vanity she did not scruple to acknowledge the above fact indeed she often advanced it as an argument to prove that she must know better than he and as a reason for her assertion and maintenance of petticoat government but if vanity were not her failing 
avarice was her ruling vice and to gratify her love for gold she never hesitated at a crime in this latter respect mr bunce was no better than his spouse save that his anxiety to obtain money was not always equalled by his readiness to face the danger occasionally involved in procuring it any act of turpitude that might be accomplished safely and quietly would find no moral opponent in the person of toby bunce but when some little daring or display of firmness was required he was forced to supply himself with an artificial energy through the medium of the gin bottle the room to which we have introduced our readers was furnished with bare necessities and nothing more a rickety greasy deal table four or five of the commonest description of rush-bottomed chairs a long form to accommodate extra company and an old portable cupboard fitting into one of the angles of the apartment and a shelf to serve as a larder these were the principal articles of the domestic economy the table was spread with a varied assortment of crockery none of the cups matching with the saucers and no two cups or no two saucers alike toby bunce having succeeded in inducing the kettle to boil by means of sundry bits of wood sparingly applied his wife betsy made the tea while jacob cut the bread and butter i wonder whether tom will keep his appointment said old death as he sipped his tea it's a full hour past the time i told him to be here and we've been waiting for him till the fire got so low that it took a power of wood to make it burn up again observed toby bunn suppose it did cried his wife you know very well that we don't care about any expense when our best friend mr bones is with us she added glancing towards old death for the bunces were among the very few of that individual's acquaintances who knew his real name and yet i should think he would not fail continued old death in a musing strain his conduct seemed straightforward and right enough on the very first day we agreed to terms and he even gave me my regulars in a matter that i had nothing to do with but it was well for him that he did so or else he'd have been laid up in lavender for want of bail burton shaw and watkins did it pretty tidy said jacob who was making prodigious inroads into the bread and butter keep your observations to yourself growled old death in a surly tone remember i haven't forgotten your negligence in losing sight of tom rain the other day when he left the police office it wasn't my fault returned the lad his dark eyes flashing angrily i kept lurking about the court after i'd been up here to tell you that dykes had nabbed mr rainford i saw him go over to the coffee-houses soon after he was discharged i followed him when he went in a coach to pall mall i dogged him back again to bow street and then and then when the jewess's case was over you saw him come out again and you lost sight of him interrupted old death angrily but never mind he added softening a little i will set you to watch him another day when you've nothing better to do and we'll find out all that i want to know about him when did you see him last inquired toby bunce this morning at tullock's and old death was interrupted by a knock at the street door to which summons jacob hastened to respond in a few moments he returned accompanied by tom rain who sauntered into the room with a complacent air and a chimney-pot hat stuck on the right side of his head so you are come at last tom said old bones alias old death his toothless jaws grinning a ghastly satisfaction well better late than never but let me introduce you to my very particular friends mr and mrs bunce and as they are good friends of mine they will be good friends to you this crib of theirs is convenient in more ways than one added the old man significantly and you will find it so if you ever want to lay up for a time until the storm which must menace one sometimes blows over the hint may not prove useless at a pinch said tom carelessly as he seated himself on the form but there's someone present whose name you've not yet mentioned old chap and he glanced toward the sickly lad who was occupied with the edible portion of the repast oh 
that's my mercury my messenger my confidant or anything else you like to call him said bones his name is jacob smith for want of a better and he's a perfect treasure in his way he can send an officer two streets off and will prove the best scout that ever a general commanding an army could possibly employ now you know his qualifications and if you ever want to make use of them he is at your service well my lad exclaimed tom rain your master gives a good character of you and mind you continue to deserve it he added in an ironical smile but what is to be done now old fellow this question was addressed to bones who accordingly prepared himself to answer it there's something to be done to-morrow night my dear boy began the old villain his dark eyes gleaming from beneath their shaggy overhanging brows and there's money much money to be got but the thing is a difficult one and requires great tact as well as courage you must suppose beforehand that i am the person to manage it properly said rain or i should think you would not have applied to me very true tom returned old death with a sepulchral chuckle very true the fact is you're a dashing genteel looking and well-spoken fellow when you choose and you can insinuate yourself into the good graces of the best-born gentleman in the land i am sure you can do this don't you think you can tom i should rather fancy i can replied rainford by no means displeased with the compliment just paid him but go on explain yourself and we shall then see what can be done listen attentively said old death between streatham and norwood there stands a pretty but lonely house occupied by a gentleman named torrens he is a widower and has two daughters the eldest of these girls is to be married the day after to-morrow to a certain mr frank curtis the nephew of the wealthy sir christopher blunt it appears that mr torrens has fallen into some difficulty through over speculation in building houses at norwood and sir christopher has consented to advance him five thousand pounds on condition that this match takes place for the girl it seems is totally opposed to it she has another lover whom she loves and she hates mr frank curtis but the father insists on sacrificing his daughter to whom curtis is greatly attached and curtis possessing influence enough over his uncle sir christopher to persuade him to advance the money all this is clear enough said rain and nothing would give me greater pleasure than to balk sir christopher frank curtis and the selfish old father but i do not see how the business can in any way benefit us i will tell you my dear boy replied old death with another chuckle expressive of deep satisfaction to-morrow evening sir christopher the nephew and sir christopher's lawyer will set out for torrens cottage as the place is called they will settle all the preliminary business with the father to-morrow night so that the marriage may take place the first thing on the ensuing morning well said tom inquiringly seeing that old death paused and two thousand pounds out of the five will be conveyed from london to torrens cottage to-morrow night continued bones unless he added significantly something happens to stop the money on its way but who will have the money upon him sir christopher the nephew or the lawyer demanded tom ah that's the point to ascertain cried old death you must exercise your tact in solving this doubt and your courage will afterwards effect the rest did i not say that this business required alike tact and courage you did indeed answered rain and i can scarcely see how the deuce the thing is to be managed still two thousand pounds would prove very welcome but how came you to learn all this the knight's servant my dear boy is in my pay returned old death with a triumphant grin ah i have many gentlemen's and noblemen's domestics devoted to my interest in the same manner and by their means i learn a great deal but to return to our present business two thousand pounds are to be paid down as an earnest of the bargain to-morrow night and those two thousand pounds will be much better appropriated 
to our uses i perfectly agree with you old fellow said rain could not the knight's servant inform you who is likely to take charge of the money impossible cried bones but he will most probably accompany the party and how will they go demanded rain a thought striking him on horseback answered old death sir christopher and his nephew have a great opinion of themselves as riders and the lawyer mr howard is a sporting character it is therefore sure that they will all go on horseback then leave the rest to me cried tom rain snapping his fingers what time do they set out at six o'clock was the answer good again observed tom it's as dark then as at midnight this time of the year say no more upon the subject the thing is just the same as if it was done provided your information is correct and no change takes place in the plan as at present laid down by these gentlemen one word however describe sir christopher's servant to me a short thin dapper made fellow dark curly hair face marked with the smallpox replied old death drab livery turned up with red his name is john jeffreys enough said tom i shall call at tullock's to-morrow between two and three in the afternoon and if you have anything fresh to communicate you can either leave a note or meet me there if i neither see nor hear from you at that time and place i shall consider that all remains as you have now represented you have nothing more to say at present nothing replied bones after a moment's reflection won't you take a drop of brandy and water mr rainford just a little drop inquired toby bunce with a deferential glance towards his better half a little drop stupid you good big drop you mean cried the shrew isn't mr rainford a friend of mr bones and ain't all mr bones is friends our friends i'm sure if mr rainford would drink a, 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 a pint of brandy she added emphatically defining the quantity she felt disposed to place at the service of the new acquaintance he is quite welcome no thank ye said rainford i must be off the business of to-morrow night requires consideration and he was interrupted by a knock at the street door and toby bunce hastened to answer the summons end of section eight recording by gray clayton section nine of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by gray clayton the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds section nine chapter nine a death scene locks fields the room door was left open and the inmates could therefore hear everything that took place in the passage tom bunce opened the street door cautiously and said who's there in the name of heaven grant me a night's lodging exclaimed the appealing voice of a female if not for myself at least for this poor dear child toby shut the door screamed the querulous tones of mrs bunce from the back room we don't want beggars and poor children here stay said tom rain never be hard-hearted and hastening to the door he saw by the light of a shop window opposite the form of a miserable-looking female crouching upon the steps and with one arm around the neck of a little boy who was crying bitterly come in my good woman said rainford i will pay any expenses that your presence may entail on the people of the house come in i say but the poor creature fell back insensible toby take care of the child cried tom rain in an authoritative tone while i lift the woman off the steps and suiting the action to the word he raised the senseless being in his arms and conveyed her into the passage toby following with the little boy who seemed to be about five or six years old surely you're mad tom exclaimed old death advancing from the back room to bring strangers into this house i should be a brute to see a dying woman turned away from the door of this or any other house said rainford firmly stand back let me have my way my purse shall satisfy the bunces for any trouble this business may give them well 
Well, be it as you will, growled Old Death. And then, in a hasty whisper to Betsy Bunce, he added, You'd better let him do as he likes. He's a queer fellow, but very useful, and must not be offended. Thus advised, and cheered moreover by Rain's liberal promise of payment, Mrs. Bunce suddenly exhibited a vast amount of sympathy on behalf of the poor creature. And, having fetched a candle from the back room, she lighted Rainford, who carried the still senseless woman in his arms, upstairs to a chamber where there was a sordid kind of bed. Rainford placed his burden on the miserable pallet, and Betsy Bunce applied such restoratives as the circumscribed economy of her household furnished. In the meantime, Toby had brought the little boy into the chamber, and the child, hastening towards the bed, exclaimed, Mama, dear Mama, speak to me. Why don't you speak to me? The woman opened her eyes languidly, but the moment they encountered the face of the child, they were lighted up with joy, and snatching the little boy to her breast, she murmured in a faint tone, I thought I'd lost you, Charles. I dreamt that we were separated. Oh, my head! it seems to split and she pressed her open palm to her forehead with all the appearance of intense suffering we must pause a moment to observe that this woman seemed to be about five and thirty years of age that she was dressed in widow's weeds of the coarsest materials and that her entire aspect denoted dreadful privations and great sufferings mental as well as physical the boy was also attired in mourning garments, and though his little cheeks were wan, and his form emaciated, still he was a very interesting child. My good woman, said Tom Ray in approaching the bed, banish all misgivings relative to the present, for you shall be taken care of. Then, turning towards Mrs. Bunce, he directed her to procure food, and to send Jacob for a surgeon no no it's useless cried the poor woman alluding to the latter order i feel that i am dying my last hour is come the child threw his arms around her neck and wept piteously oh my god cried the wretched stranger who will now take care of you my poor dear dear little charles i who have been to you as a mother yes you are my mamma my own mamma exclaimed the child his heart ready to burst although he scarcely understood the real nature of the misgivings which oppressed him sir said the woman after a few moments of profound silence during which the sobbings of the boy and the uneasy palpitations of her own breast were alone heard in the chamber sir she said addressing herself abruptly to rainford you spoke to me kindly you look kindly upon me and if i may judge by your countenance you possess a kind heart. Speak, poor woman, cried Rainford, softening almost to tears. If there's anything I can do for you, confide in me, and I swear the gratitude of a dying being is all that I can offer you in return for what I am about to ask, interrupted the woman, in a faint yet hurried tone, for she seemed to feel that she had not long to live. Draw near, sir, there, and now listen attentively. Dreadful privation! exposure to the cold sleeping in the fields painful wanderings have reduced me to this state and i shall die contentedly nay even happy if i thought i understand you cried rain you are anxious for the welfare of this boy compose your mind banish those painful reflections i swear to protect him there was something so earnest and sincere in the manner the voice and the countenance of rainford who was a creature of the most generous impulses that the dying woman believed him, and her heart bounded with fervent gratitude. Then, making a sign for Rainford to draw nearer to her still, she collected all her remaining force to utter a few last words, but physical exhaustion almost completely choked her utterance. This boy, she murmured in a faint and dying voice, is not mine. Do not weep, Charles, love. I am not your mamma although I love you, as if you were my own child. But the moment you were born, in secret and mystery, the nurse brought you to me, all having been so arranged, and, 
from that moment i but my god i am dying oh give me strength to declare that your mother is speak speak cried tom rain breathe but the name of his mother i shall catch it and i declare most solemnly oh god she is dead and it was so vain were her last last efforts to give utterance to the name which trembled upon her tongue the death rattle stifled the words in her throat her eyes glazed her countenance settled in inanimation and she was no more little charles would not believe that she was really dead to him she only appeared to sleep and this infantine delusion tom rain gradually dissipated making him aware of his sad bereavement in so delicate a manner that a stranger would have believed him to be a father himself as well as an individual of the most upright and noble principles but if rainford's morality was in some points of the most indifferent nature he nevertheless possessed kind feelings and a generous heart and the tears trickled down his cheeks as he exerted himself to console the little stranger children seemed to be endowed with an intuitive power of discrimination between those who would treat them well and those whose dispositions are severe and harsh and charles speedily acquired confidence in the good intentions of rainford at length when tom fancied that he had obtained some degree of influence over the boy's mind he led him away from the chamber where the poor woman had breathed her last old death had remained in the room below and jacob had been sent to fetch a surgeon who now arrived but departed again immediately upon a learning that his services could no longer be rendered available toby and mrs bunce had quitted the chamber of death the moment rain ejaculated oh god she is dead and thus the child had no leisure to take particular notice of any one save the individual who manifested so much kindness towards him fearing that the repulsive appearance of old death might alarm the boy and even fill his mind with misgivings relative to the person who now took charge of him rainford stopped in the dark passage downstairs and calling mrs bunce from the back room he placed five guineas in her hand saying the burial of that poor creature who has just breathed her last must be your care see that it is performed decently and if there are any papers about her person any proofs of who she is keep them for me be faithful in this respect and what i have now given you may be considered as an earnest of additional recompense rainford then left the house leading the boy by the hand proceeding to the nearest hackney coach stand tom hired one of the vehicles and desired to be driven to the elephant and castle previous however to entering the vehicle the thoughtful tom rain purchased some of the very best cakes which a shop in such a neighbourhood could produce and though the little boy kept sobbing as he repeated to himself mamma is dead for he was too young to understand that she had denied this maternity with her dying breath yet he ate greedily of the food for he was famished rainford said but little to him beyond a few occasional cheering and consolatory words as they rode along because the heavy rumblings of the vehicle rendered it difficult to hear what was uttered within in about three-quarters of an hour the church stopped at the elephant and castle and rainford conducting the boy tenderly by the hand plunged into the maze of streets which form a neighbourhood requiring a detailed description any one who is acquainted with that part of london or who with the map of the great metropolis before him takes the trouble to follow us in this portion of our narrative will understand us when we state that almost immediately behind the elephant and castle tavern there is a considerable district totally unexplored by thousands and thousands of persons dwelling in other parts of the english capital this district is now bounded on the north by the new kent road on the east by the kent or greenwich road on the south by walworth and on the west by the walworth road built upon a low damp and unhealthy soil the dwellings of the poor there throng in frightful abundance forming narrow streets half choked up with dirt miserable alleys where the very air is stagnant and dark courts 
to enter which seems like going into the fetid vault of a church many of the streets that appear to have been huddled together without any architectural plan but merely upon a studied system of crowding together as many hovels as possible have their back windows looking upon ditches the black mire and standing water of which exhale vapours sufficiently noxious to breed a pestilence when the sun shines upon these noisome ditches their surface displays a thousand prismatic hues thrown out by the decomposing offal and putrid vegetables which have been emptied into those open sewers but sewers they cannot be called for instead of carrying off the filth of the neighbourhood those ditches preserve it stagnant a considerable portion of the district we are describing is known by the name of locks fields and the horrible condition of this locality can only be properly understood by a visit the pen cannot convey an adequate idea of the loathsome squalor of that poverty the heart-rending proofs of that wretchedness and the revolting examples of that utter demoralization which characterize this section of the metropolis the houses for the most part contain each four rooms every room serving as the domicile of a separate family perhaps one of the members of such a family may be afflicted with some infectious malady there he must lie upon his flock mattress or his bundle of rags or his heap of straw until he become through neglect so offensive as to render one minute with him intolerable and yet his relatives four five even six in number are compelled to sleep in the same apartment with him inhaling the stench from that mass of putrefaction hearing his groans breathing the steam from his corrupted lungs and swarming with the myriads of loathsome animalcule engendered by the filth of the place in another room perhaps we shall find some old man living by himself starving upon the miserable pittance obtained by picking up bones or rags doing an odd job now and then for a neighbour and filling up the intervals of such pursuits by begging his entire furniture consisting of a cup a kettle and a knife no chair no table but with a heap of rubbish in one corner for a bed on which he sleeps with his clothes on in a third room there is most likely a family consisting of a man and his wife who at night occupy one mattress and their grown-up sons and daughters who all pig together upon another shame and decency exist not amongst them because they could never have known either they have all been accustomed from their infancy to each other's nakedness and as their feelings are brutalized by such a mode of existence they suffer no scruples to oppose that fearful intercourse which their sensuality suggests thus for we must speak plainly as we speak the truth the very wretchedness of the poor which compels this family commingling in one room as it were in one bed leads to incest horrible revolting incest the fourth room in the house which we take for our example of the dwellings in locks fields is occupied by the landlord or landlady or both and there is perhaps no more morality nor cleanliness in their chamber than in either of the others the shops in locks fields are naturally in keeping with the means and habits of their customers beer shops and public houses abound the lower and the poorer the locality the greater the number of such establishments but who can wonder crime requires its stimulants and poverty its consolation men drink to nerve themselves to perpetrate misdeeds which are attended with peril women drink to supply that artificial flow of spirits necessary to the maintenance of a career of prostitution and the honest poor drink to save themselves from the access of maddening despair children drink also because they see their parents drink and because they have acquired the taste from their earliest infancy and thus beer shops and public houses thrive most gloriously in the most wretched neighbourhoods locks fields abounds with small general shops where everything is sold in the minutest detail a pennyworth of sugar 
a penny farthing worth of tea a farthing in candle or a quarter of a pound of bacon for a penny there are also many eating-houses where leg of beef soup can be procured for five farthings the bowl the knackers do a good business with the owners of those establishments tripe shops are likewise far from rare and upon their boards and the open windows may be seen gory slices of black-looking liver tongues and brains in a dish sheep's heads huge cow heels chitterlings piles of horses flesh and rolls of boiled offal upon sticks the two last mentioned species of article being intended for cat's meat but the whole heaped pell-mell together loathsome to behold and emitting odours of the most fetid and nauseating description coal sheds where potatoes and greens may likewise be purchased abound in locks fields as do also pie shops and that kind of eating houses where pudding fried in grease stocking pudding and sop in the pan are displayed in the windows to tempt with their succulent appearance the appetites of hungry men passing to their work or of half famished children wearied of playing in the gutter it is wretched heart-rending to linger on a description of this kind but we must endeavour to make it as complete as possible the generality of the inhabitants of locks fields are in a state of barbarian ignorance nine-tenths of the children even of ten or twelve years old are unable to read and know not who jesus christ is nor that the saviour of mankind suffered upon the cross to save them as well as the proudest peers or the most brilliant peeresses that shine in the realms of fashion look more closely at the aspect of the population in locks fields what care is depicted upon the pale cheek of that emaciated woman who is hanging the one change of linen upon the elder bushes skirting the black ditch behind her dwelling and yet she is better off than many of her neighbours because her family does possess the one change of linen behold that man sitting on the threshold of his door smoking his pipe his elbows rest upon his knees he stares vacantly before him not even the opiatic influence of tobacco soothes him he is thinking of what will become of his wife and children when he shall be out of work because the job on which he has lately been engaged will be finished on the coming saturday his wife comes out to speak to him and he answers her harshly his children approach him and endeavour to climb up his knees but he knocks them away yet that man is not brutal by nature he loves his wife and children and was even debating within himself whether he should not soon turn thief in order to support them when they thus accosted him and were repulsed let another person insult his wife let a stranger lay a finger upon that man's children and the demon will be raised within his breast but he speaks harshly and treats them all brutally because he is miserable because he is dissatisfied with everything and everybody because he is reduced to despair the unfeeling aspect of the cold world around him that world which frowns so sternly upon poverty and smiles so sweetly upon wealth has rendered him unfeeling his hard fate drives him to the public house talk of the infamy of which that man is guilty in spending a few pence the pence which would buy his children more bread upon beer or gin it is ridiculous that man must drink he must drown his care thought drives him mad and from thought he must therefore fly but whither can he fly the rich and well-to-do have their theatres and places of amusement if a penny tea garden or a penny theatre be opened in locks fields or in any other poor neighbourhood the magistrates must put it down it is a source of demoralisation it is a focus of thieves and prostitutes but the swell mob and flash women frequent the haymarket theatre and the lyceum and the surrey and the victoria 
ay and covent garden and drury lane theatres also oh cries the magistrate that is very different yes everything in this country is different when the wealthy or the well-dressed are concerned on one side and the poor and the ragged on the other then whither can this pauperized despairing man in locks field go to escape the bitterness of his reflections to the public house or to throw himself into the canal those are the only alternatives is it not dreadful to think that we have a sovereign and a royal family on whom the country lavishes money by hundreds of thousands whose merest whims cost sums that would feed and clothe from year to year all the inhabitants of such a place as locks fields that we also have an hereditary aristocracy and innumerable sleek and comfortable dignitaries of the church who devour the fruits of the earth and throw the parings and the peelings contemptuously to the poor in a word that we have an oligarchy feasting upon the fatted calf and flinging the offal to the patient enduring toiling oppressed millions is it not dreadful we ask to think how much those millions do for royalty aristocracy church and the landed interest and how little how miserably little royalty aristocracy church and landed interest do for them in return but let us go back to thomas rainford and the little boy whom we left on their way to locks fields for it was to this district that the excellent-hearted man was leading his young child as they went along many were the kind words that tom rain uttered to cheer his artless companion come don't cry my little fellow he would say here's another cake and when we get home you shall have something nice for supper are you cold charlie well you shall soon warm yourself by the side of a good blazing fire and to-night you shall sleep in a soft bed and to-morrow morning you shall have some new clothes i'm going to take you where you will find a pretty lady who will be as kind to you as the mummer you have just lost are you tired charlie well i'll take you up and carry you and tom rain lifted the poor child in his arms and kissed away the tears which ran down his cheeks the boy threw his little arms around the neck of this kind protector and said oh you are as good to me as my dear papa was and how long has your papa been dead charlie asked rainford supposing that the child meant by his father the husband of the woman who had died that evening in toby bunce's house not very long but i don't know how long was the reply oh stay i think i heard mamma say this morning that he died six months ago and where did you live then charlie at a cottage near a great town um oh i remember winchester winchester cried rainford i know all that part of the country well or at least i ought to do so he murmured to himself with a profound sigh but what made you leave your cottage when papa was buried mamma had no money replied the child and some naughty people came at last and took away all the things in the cottage and turned mamma and me out of doors and then mamma cried so much oh so much and we were very often hungry after that and we sometimes had no bed to sleep in poor little fellow cried rainford hugging the child closer still to his breast what was your papa's name watts and my name is charlie watts said the boy at this moment rainford stopped at one of the few decent-looking houses in locks fields and knocked at the door which was immediately opened by a young and beautiful woman who appeared overjoyed at his return i have brought you a present in the shape of this poor little boy said rainford as he entered the house if you wish to please me you will behave to him as kindly as i shall the young woman took charlie in her arms and kissed him as a proof that tom's request should be attended to and rainford well pleased at that demonstration closed to the street door behind him end of section nine recording by gray clayton section ten of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by gray clayton 
The Mysteries of London, Volume Three, by George W. M. Reynolds, Section Ten, Chapter Ten, A Scene at the House of Sir Christopher Blunt. On the following afternoon, shortly after four o'clock, three gentlemen sat sipping their wine after an early dinner in a magnificently furnished room in Jermyn Street. The one who occupied the head of the table was a red-faced, stout, elderly gentleman with hair of that bluish black which denotes the use of an artificial dye, and with large bushy whiskers of a similar tint. He was dressed in a blue coat with brass buttons, white waistcoat, and black kerzimere trousers fitted very tight. A massive gold chain depended from his neck, and on his fingers he wore several rings of great value. In manner he was authoritative, even to rudeness, for, being immensely rich, he firmly believed that money constituted an aristocracy which had a perfect right to command. His pride was the more excessive, too, as he had risen from nothing. That is, he had begun life as an errand boy, in a linen draper's shop, and had finished his mercantile career as a warehouseman in Wood Street, where he amassed a considerable fortune. He had filled the office of sheriff, but had vainly endeavoured to procure an aldermanic gown, and having failed to persuade the liverymen of Port Soken Ward that he was the very best person they could possibly choose to represent them in the superior city court, he had ever since affected to rejoice at his rejection, and to look upon all city men and city matters with contempt. In reality, too, he was dreadfully mortified at the fact of his low origin, but with that clumsy duplicity which vulgar minds often employ in such cases, he pretended to make a boast of his humble beginnings, and used the subject as a means of constantly reminding his friends and acquaintances of what he had done for himself. While he held the shrievalty, it fell to his lot to present an address to the Prince Regent, and on that occasion he received the honour of knighthood. Such was Sir Christopher Blunt. The gentleman who sat at the bottom of the table was Mr. Frank Curtis, Sir Christopher's nephew. He was a tall, spare, thin, sickly-looking young man of three-and-twenty, with long, straight black hair large staring dark eyes, very bad teeth, and a disagreeable, impudent, pert expression of countenance. He was an orphan, and totally dependent upon his uncle, who had brought him up to no business, inasmuch as he had looked upon the young man as his heir. Sir Christopher, however, having reached his fiftieth year without ever thinking of matrimony, was suddenly smitten with Miss Julia Mordaunt, lady hatfield's friend and as miss mordaunt belonged to a very ancient though of greatly impoverished family sir christopher thought that he should gain his darling wish namely obtaining standing and consideration in the fashionable world by conducting that lady to the hymeneal altar this ardent desire he nevertheless kept to himself as much as possible his first object being to get rid of his nephew in some way or another for Mr. Frank Curtis had acquired considerable influence over his uncle, and the latter was too much of a moral coward to be able to tell his nephew boldly and frankly that he proposed to change his condition. The passion which Frank had conceived for Miss Adelis Torrens seemed to furnish the knight with an opportunity to settle the young man, and thus throw off an influence which impeded his own matrimonial designs. Hence, the readiness of Sir Christopher to lend Mr. Torrance five thousand pounds as an inducement for that gentleman to compel his portionless daughter to accept Mr. Frank Curtis for a husband. We must add that Frank had passed six months on the continent, and this brief sojourn in France had supplied the staple commodity of his entire conversational powers. Nor must we forget to observe that he was as arrogant a boaster as he was in reality a coward, and that he was so afflicted with the vice of mendaciousness that he could scarcely speak the truth by accident. 
the third gentleman present in sir christopher's splendid dining-room was mr howard the knight solicitor we need not say more relative to this individual than that he was about forty-five years old enjoyed an excellent practice was considered a fine-looking man by the ladies and was noted for his devotion to the turf the table was spread with a choice dessert and an assortment of the most exquisite wines to which the three gentlemen appeared to be doing ample justice sir christopher drank copiously because he felt particularly well pleased at the prospect of getting rid of his nephew for whom and the intended bride he had taken and furnished a beautiful house at clapham frank had frequent recurrence to the bottle because he felt nervous and anxious and the lawyer stuck fast to the burgundy because he liked it take care frank how you fill your glass too often said mr howard or the young ladies will not find you very agreeable presently don't mind me old fellow exclaimed curtis i can drink you under the table any day why when i was in paris i used to think nothing of a bottle of brandy with my breakfast i recollect once betting thirty napoleons with an old major of grenadiers at boulogne a drum major i suppose frank said the lawyer with a smile frank could not so far forget himself as to associate with a drum major observed sir christopher in a voice like that of a man who goes about with a punch and judy show thanks to my honest exertions i have placed myself and in placing myself have placed him in a position which you will permit me to call brilliant you know i make no secret of what i was i rose from nothing and i am proud of it and if his gracious majesty in acknowledgment of my humble merits condescended to bestow upon me the honour of knighthood oh blow that old story uncle cried the dutiful nephew i was telling you how i laid fifty napoleons with a colonel of french engineers that i would drink two bottles of champagne to every one of his share what time will the horses be round at the door demanded howard of the knight for the lawyer was anxious to escape the menaced tale at six o'clock precise answered sir christopher i'm always punctual i learnt punctuality when i was a lad and i firmly believed it helped to make me what i am when i look around and see how i am now situated and think of what i was do let me tell you this story interrupted frank refilling his glass it's a capital one i can assure you well so the french major-general and me we sat down at a table and spread out the hundred and fifty napoleons that we had bet then we rang the bell and ordered three bottles of burgundy to begin with two for me and one for him burgundy was it said the lawyer sipping his wine no claret and i told you so exclaimed curtis but how provoking you are well so the lieutenant-general and me we began to drink the champagne just as it was so much water both of us eyeing the two hundred napoleons half past four said mr howard looking at his watch and with difficulty suppressing a yawn for i felt sure of winning and so did he continued frank curtis well i soon disposed of my two bottles of port and the general drank his one like a trojan to work we went again two more for me and another for him and then i proposed cigars because i knew that i could stand smoking better than him he agreed and we puffed away like two factory chimneys at last he showed signs of distress oh got quite groggy like a prize-fighter at the fortieth round observed mr howard exactly said frank and so by the time i had finished my sixth bottle of sherry and the field-marshal had got only halfway through his third he was completely sewn up i pocketed the five hundred napoleons as a matter of course rang the bell to desire the waiter to take the admiral off to bed and then went and did the amiable with an evening party where no one could tell that i had ever been drinking at all and so you think that a very pleasant adventure master frank said sir christopher now for my part i leave guzzling and hard drinking to those vulgar citizens the other side of temple bar do you know howard that i really believe it was the most fortunate day of my life when i lost the election for port soken if i had become an alderman you would have looked the alderman to perfection sir christopher 
observed the lawyer. Well, well, I might have been dignified on the bench, or I might not, said the knight complacently. That's a mere matter of opinion, although I have been told by a friend who is not accustomed to flatter that I have more sense, sound sense, I mean, in my little finger than all the aldermen and common councilmen put together. But it was fortunate for me, very fortunate, that I escaped from the vulgar contact of those citizens. At this moment, a servant entered the room to announce that a gentleman desired to speak to Sir Christopher Blunt. Show him up, show him up, cried the knight. I have no secrets that my nephew and solicitor may not hear. The domestic retired, and in a few minutes he reappeared, ushering in Rainford by the name of Captain Sparks. Tom was dressed in his usual sporting garb, over which he wore a white topcoat, an article of attire much in vogue in those days among gentlemen who were accustomed to ride much on horseback. As he walked, his silver spurs clinked on the heels of his well-polished boots, and in his right hand he carried a whip. "'Beg your pardon, gentlemen, for this intrusion,' said Tom as he entered the room, "'but having heard from my very particular friend, Mr. Torrance, "'of the little affair that is to take place tomorrow morning—' "'Pray sit down, Captain Sparks,' interrupted Sir Christopher. "'Any friend of Mr. Torrance is welcome in this house. "'I do not, however, remember that he has mentioned your name in my hearing.' "'Very likely not,' said Rainford, drawing the chair close to the table. The fact is, I've been travelling in the north for my amusement during the last two years, and I only returned to town this morning. The first thing I did was to run down and see my dear friend Torrens, and you may fancy how surprised and pleased I was to learn what an excellent match his eldest daughter was about to make. There is the bridegroom, Captain Sparks, said the knight, pompously waving his hand towards his nephew. "'Very happy to form your acquaintance, Mr. Curtis,' exclaimed Tom, with a polite bow. "'Equally delighted to know you, Captain,' replied the nephew. "'Here's a clean glass, and there's the bottle. Help yourself.' "'With much pleasure,' said Tom, suiting the action to the word. "'But I was about to tell you that Mr. Torrance did me the honour to invite me to the wedding. "'And as I was obliged to come back to town to have my portmanteau sent down to the cottage,' I've made bold to intrude myself upon you, gentlemen, with the view of joining your party, that is, if you will permit me. We shall be quite charmed, Captain Sparks, answered Sir Christopher Blunt, but I need not inquire if you proceed to the cottage on horseback. Oh, yes, none of your coaches or carriages for me, returned Tom. I put up my horse at the stables close by in York Street, for my groom was taken ill a couple of hours ago. "'Our horses are also there,' interrupted Sir Christopher. "'And one of my grooms,' he added ostentatiously, "'shall bring round yours when he fetches ours. "'But I beg pardon for my rudeness, Captain Sparks. "'This gentleman is Mr. Howard, my solicitor.' "'Rainford and the lawyer bowed to each other. "'The wine went round, and Tom chuckled inwardly "'at the success of his stratagem to obtain access to the night.' You see, Captain Sparks, said Sir Christopher in a dictatorial tone, this projected alliance has met with some little opposition on the part of the young lady herself. So Torrens told me this afternoon, observed Tom coolly, but the qualifications of your nephew, Sir Christopher, are doubtless such. I flatter myself, exclaimed Curtis, pleased with the compliment, that I have the knack of making myself agreeable to the woman when I choose. Why, the day that I left Paris, the French marchioness took poison, and a countess went melancholy mad, both without any apparent cause, but I knew, deuced well, that I was the reason, though. You're a sad fellow, Frank, said the lawyer. Now, why should you assert that? cried the young man, affecting to be annoyed by the remark. Did I tell you that anything particular occurred between me and those ladies? Suppose the Duchess did have a little partiality for me, and suppose the Baroness was the least thing jealous, eh? What then? Ah, what then indeed, said Tom Brain. Mr. Curtis is too much a man of honour to betray those fair ones who are weak enough to be beguiled by his soft nonsense. Egad, you're right, exclaimed Frank, in whose good opinion the self-styled captain was rapidly rising. I wouldn't give a fig for a fellow that boasts of his conquests. But if anyone might boast on that subject, I think it is your humble servant. What do you say, Howard? Haven't I told you some queer tales at times? 
you have indeed answered the lawyer dryly talking of boasting captain sparks said the knight who now found means to thrust in a word it's my opinion that the only legitimate boast is that which a man can make of having risen from nothing now i never attempt to conceal my origin on the contrary i glory in it why sir i began life without a sixpence and without a friend and now look at me tom rain did look at sir christopher as he was requested to do and it struck our friend that there was nothing very particular to admire in the worthy knight after all you see me captain sparks continued sir christopher in an authoritative tone well sir such as i am now i made myself and the more to your credit said tom who couldn't help thinking that if the knight's words were to be taken literally it was a great pity that he hadn't made himself a trifle handsomer while he was about it come howard pass the bottle old fellow cried frank curtis who always got disgustingly familiar when he was in his cups which was so often that he was seldom out of them and as is the case with all persons who boast of the quantity that they can drink it didn't require much to upset him remember he added we have a rather lonely road to travel part of the way why you surely cannot be a friend of robbers mr curtis exclaimed tom bursting out into a merry laugh i afraid ejaculated the young man not i i should think not indeed why when i was travelling from abbeville to paris in the mail we were stopped by three highwaymen in the middle of the night the government courier and myself tackled them in a moment we were the only persons in the mail and the postboy was so frightened he got off his seat and hid himself under one of the horses well the poor courier was soon disabled but i was not easily done up egad in less than three minutes i forced the whole five scoundrels to sheer off oh i have no doubt of it said tom very quietly a powerful and courageous young gentleman like you must be a match for any five highwaymen in the world come come now exclaimed frank i didn't say that exactly but i will assert this much that i have no more fears of a robber than i should have of a child stopping me on the highway in that case observed mr howard you had better take charge of the money that's to be paid over to mr torrens presently oh as for that but never mind cried frank not appearing particularly to relish the office of treasurer thus forced upon him yet unable to decline the trust after his maniloquent vaunting i'll keep the two thousand pounds safe enough depend on it sir christopher looked at his watch and finding that the hour for departure was approaching he rang the bell to order the horses precisely as the clock struck six the party attended by john jeffreys with whom rain had found an opportunity to exchange a word or two quitted jermyn street and rode towards westminster bridge end of section ten recording by gray clayton section eleven of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter eleven the two thousand pounds torrens cottage the evening was bright clear and frosty and the stars shone resplendently on the wide arch of heaven well wrapped up in their great coats the party of horsemen pursued their way and at about seven o'clock they turned from the main road near streatham common into a by-lane leading towards torrens cottage thus leaving streatham itself on their right hand sir christopher and the lawyer rode about a hundred yards in advance tom rain and frank curtis having stopped at a public-house to procure cigars jeffreys the groom was about fifty yards in the rear you must come and see us captain sparks after the honeymoon said curtis we shall be delighted to make you welcome i shall avail myself of your kind offer returned tom 
and you and me will try who can stand his bottle best continued the young man but what atrocious cigars these are i remember when i was in paris i was very intimate with a certain foreign prince who was staying there and i don't mind hinting to you that i was a great favourite with the princess too she was a charming woman a very charming woman i never saw such eyes in my life well the prince was a great smoker and he one day gave me a, a box of his prime cigars such cigars i never smoked such beauties before or since poor fellow he was killed in a duel shortly afterwards killed in a duel exclaimed tom what by you oh no i was his second replied curtis who as usual invented the story as he went on it seems that an officer of french horse guards had been boasting of the favours which he pretended to have received from the marchioness and the marquis heard of it he instantly sent for me and desired me to carry the grenadier officer a message i did so and the hostile encounter took place in boulogne wood the hussar officer pinked the count slap through in no time for it appeared that he was the best swordsman in all france well of course i was desperately savage to see my poor friend the duke knocked off the hooks in that unceremonious way and i determined to avenge him so i challenged the light infantry officer on the spot and we fought for six hours without either of us getting a scratch or yielding a foot of ground our swords were worn as thin as skewers i have no doubt of it said tom coolly it must have been a splendid sight it was indeed returned frank but at last i obtained a trifling advantage the artillery officer had a cold and i watched him anxiously to catch him off his guard when he sneezed egad that was a glorious idea of mine and it succeeded too for after nine hours hard fighting i ran him through just as a cook spits a joint you cannot imagine what a reputation that affair gave me in paris every one was desirous to see the young englishman who had killed the best swordsman in france and after all without boasting it was a feat to be proud of decidedly so observed tom but you are too brave a man mr curtis to indulge in idle boasts of course cried frank fellows like you and me captain who know what swords and pistols mean are the last to brag of their exploits do you carry pistols with you mr curtis asked tom generally generally was the reply but i did not think it necessary to take them with me this evening well i did said rainford and here is one he added producing the weapon from the pocket of his white great coat pray don't hold it near me captain cried frank reining in his horse with a trepidation most remarkable on the part of a gentleman who had performed such gallant deeds in resisting highwaymen and as a duellist yes but i shall not only hold it near you said tom i shall also fire it unless you instantly and without noise hand me over that pocket-book which you have about you captain sparks ejaculated the trembling young man this passes a joke come now i never was more serious in my life interrupted rainford sharply give me the pocket-book or and the sharp click of the pistol as tom cocked it sounded like a death warrant upon the cowardly boaster's ears in fact he sat paralyzed motionless speechless upon his horse at a loss how to act come be quick cried rain seizing him by the collar of his coat i have no time for any of your nonsense you-you can't mean stammered the young man that you-yes i mean that i am a highwayman if you like to call me so interrupted tom impatiently and so give me the pocket-book curtis obeyed with trembling hand and sinking heart and now said tom as the sounds of the trampling of a horse announced that the groom was approaching one word of caution you are going to drag a young lady into a match most unwelcome to her beware how you accomplish her unhappiness by forcing her to accept as a husband 
such a contemptible boaster and arrant liar as you are beware i say or you will see more than you like of captain sparks having thus spoken rainford turned his horse round and galloped away with lightning speed john jeffreys whom he passed in the lane did not of course attempt to molest him but when the groom overtook frank curtis he said anything the matter sir i saw the captain gallop back again like an arrow captain ejaculated the young man he is a robber a thief a gallows bird what do you mean sir asked jeffreys affecting profound astonishment he has plundered me of two thousand pounds john cried frank in so lamentable a tone that the groom could hardly suppress a violent indication to laugh robbed you sir exclaimed jeffreys you're joking sir no two men in england could rob you we had a desperate tussle for it john replied curtis but the villain knocked me off my horse with the butt end of his pistol it was a cowardly blow and i was not prepared for it most likely not sir said the groom dryly but i thought he must have used some underhand means because i know what sort of a customer you must be you're right enough there my man returned curtis i had got the better of him at one time and although he has gone off with the two thousand pounds he has carried away with him such a drubbing that he won't forget in a hurry but let us ride after my uncle and mr howard because he might come back added frank casting a terrified glance behind him the young gentleman and the servant put spurs to their horses and in a quarter of an hour overtook the knight and the lawyer to whom frank related in his own style the adventure which had just occurred and you mean to say that you surrendered the pocket-book that you gave up two thousand pounds exclaimed sir christopher in a passion what could i do said frank the scoundrel took the money from me by main force he was stronger than the five highwaymen in france observed the lawyer quietly stronger i believe you cried curtis and then he was armed to the very teeth why when he threw open his green cutaway coat i could see by the starlight a belt stuck round with pistols daggers and sharp knives or else do you think for a moment that he could have mastered me well the mischief is done said the knight in a doleful tone and a pretty figure we shall cut at the torrens's i dare swear that the rascal is no more an acquaintance of the family than he is of the king of england it is to be hoped he is not observed mr howard who was mightily pleased to think that he had handed over the money into frank's keeping previously to setting out it is to be hoped not otherwise your nephew sir christopher would be marrying into a nice family really mr howard this is no time for jesting exclaimed the knight but why didn't you try and stop the villain john ay sir said the groom how should i know that he had committed a robbery when he galloped past me besides if he is such a terrible chap as mr frank represents him it would have been useless for me to try my hand with him certainly john is quite right observed mr curtis if i could do nothing with him i'm sure no one else could he is as strong as a lion and egad how he did swear it was quite horrible to hear him but what shall we do do indeed ejaculated sir christopher we shall look like so many fools when we arrive at the cottage but mr torrens will take your cheque sir christopher remarked the lawyer true we can manage it in that way said the knight still the cash would have appeared more business-like on such an occasion but it is growing late let us push on yes let us push on echoed frank casting troubled glances around and trembling lest the highwayman should take it into his head to return and rob the remainder of the party in twenty minutes they reached torrens cottage the inmates of which we must pause to describe 
mr torrens was a widower and had numbered about five-and-fifty years he was a tall thin dry-looking man with a very sallow complexion a cold grey eye and a stern expression of countenance after having long held a situation in a government office he retired with a pension and just at the same period a relation died leaving him a few thousand pounds with this sum he bought a beautiful little villa which he denominated torrens cottage and the leasehold of some land at norwood where he set busily to work to build a row of houses to be called torrens terrace he had long made architecture an amateur study during his leisure hours and the moment he was enabled to retire from his situation in the ordnance office and became possessed of capital he resolved to put his numerous architectural theories into practice but as it frequently happens in such matters he grew embarrassed and the works were menaced with stoppage for want of funds when mr curtis became enamoured of his eldest daughter whom he met at the house of some of mr torrens's relations in london the bargain already described was soon after struck between sir christopher blunt and mr torrens who did not hesitate to sacrifice his daughter's happiness to his own pecuniary interests unfortunately too for the young lady he did not regard the contemplated union in the light of a sacrifice at all inasmuch as he naturally looked upon frank curtis as sir christopher's heir not dreaming that the worthy knight entertained the remotest idea of perpetrating matrimony mr torrens therefore considered that his daughter adelais was about to form a most eligible connection and although he was aware that her affections were engaged in another quarter he acted upon the belief that parents must know best how to ensure their children's happiness his two daughters adelais and rosamond were both charming girls of the respective ages of eighteen and sixteen their dark clustering locks their deep hazel eyes lustrous with liquid light and their symmetrical figures filled all beholders with admiration adelais was now pale melancholy and drooping for she loathed the alliance that was in contemplation for her loathed it not only because her heart was another's but also because the manners conversation and personal appearance of frank curtis were revolting in her estimation rosamond possessed a rich complexion in which glowed all the innate feelings of her soul animating and imparting to every feature of her beautiful face an additional charm she was naturally the confidante of her sister whose hard fate she deeply deplored and many were the plans which the amiable girls had devised and discussed with a view to overcome their father's cruel pertinacity in insisting on the sacrifice of adelaide to frank curtis but each and all of those projects had either failed or involved proceedings repugnant to their pure and artless minds for instance they had thought of abandoning the paternal roof and endeavouring to seek their livelihood by needlework in some safe retirement then adelais would not permit rosamond to dare the misfortunes of the world by flying from a home which she the younger sister had at least no personal motive to desert and rosamond on her side would not allow adelais to set out alone again a clandestine marriage between adelais and her lover was often debated the young man urged it himself but the daughters dreaded the father's eternal anger and thus this project had been abandoned also to be brief the dreaded moment was now at hand and the seal of misery was about to be set on the roll of the elder maiden's destinies and who was the lover of adelais a handsome generous-hearted honourable young man occupying a situation in the very government office where mr torrens had himself served for many years but although clarence villiers was so far provided for and had every prospect of rising rapidly on account of his steady habits and assiduous attention to his employment yet he was at present only a poor clerk with ninety pounds a year and he had no capital mr torrens as we have seen required capital and thus frank curtis was preferred 
to clarence villiers we cannot quit this description without alluding to the ardent affection which existed between the sisters having lost their mother in their childhood and their father being almost constantly from home throughout the day they were naturally thrown entirely upon each other for companionship an illimitable confidence sprang up between them a confidence more intimate far than even that which usually subsists between sisters because this confidence on the part of adelais and rosamond extended to a mutual outpouring of their most trivial as well as of their most important thoughts hopes or aspirations thus the reader will cease to be astonished that when adelais in the anguish of her heart had contemplated flight from the paternal roof as the only alternative save a hateful marriage rosamond insisted upon accompanying her much as they loved and revered their father they were both prepared to sacrifice even filial affection and filial duty for each other's sake this feeling may be looked upon as one involving a grievous fault on their side it was not however the less firmly rooted in their minds for they were all and all to each other End of section eleven section twelve of the mysteries of london volume three this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the mysteries of london volume three by george w m reynolds chapter twelve idlay and rosamond sir christopher blunt mr howard and frank curtis were soon seated in mr torrens comfortable parlour the walls of which were adorned with an infinite variety of architectural plans set in carved oaken frames a cheerful fire blazed in the grate wine was placed upon the table and the travellers were speedily as much at their ease as they could wish or as their host could render them the young ladies were in another apartment mr torrens having desired them to remain in the drawing-room while the commercial part of the projected matrimonial arrangement was being settled in the parlour when the usual complimentary phrases had been exchanged and sir christopher had observed that the weather was remarkably fine but very cold a proposition to which mr torrens entirely assented for somehow or another people never do contradict each other when commenting on that subject when also a glass or two of wine had been imbibed by each the knight inquired whether mr torrens happened to be acquainted with a captain sparks the answer was a negative sir christopher then began to relate the adventure of the evening and although he was constantly interrupted by his nephew who was anxious to interpolate in the narrative certain saving clauses respecting his own valour towards the highwayman the worthy knight nevertheless succeeded at length in bringing the tale to an end it is clear said mr torrens that you were first duped and then robbed by an infamous scoundrel but have you any notion how he could have learnt enough of the pending arrangements to be enabled to talk so familiarly with regard to them when he first introduced himself to you that puzzles me my dear sir returned sir christopher and it is likely to continue to puzzle you uncle observed frank for the whole business defies conjecture i remember when i was in france the villain evidently knew that you would leave town with a considerable sum of money in your possession said torrens and his aim was to get it he did get it too but not without a deuced good thrashing into the bargain cried frank and that's some consolation i dare say captain sparks as he calls himself would gladly be thrashed every hour in the day on the same terms observed the lawyer but i think that when our little business is concluded i should do well to return to london and give information at bow street as speedily as possible 
by no means exclaimed sir christopher we must keep the tale to ourselves if it got into the newspapers with all the particulars it would only make us look ridiculous we might punish the man but we should never get back the money no no let the matter drop for all our sakes thank heaven continued the knight assuming a slower and more pompous tone the loss is paltry very paltry in my estimation i shall not miss the amount i can assure you but you have no objection to my giving the scoundrel another good drubbing uncle the first time i meet him again inquired frank curtis with great apparent earnestness oh there can be no objection to that if the captain will allow you so to operate on him said the lawyer dryly allow me indeed i should like to know how he could prevent it exclaimed frank affecting deep indignation at the remark you should have seen the struggle we had very likely but i noticed your greatcoat when we came in just now and it was not soiled said howard of course not i had him down all the time then it was a great pity you did not keep him there come come enough of this fencing cried sir christopher produce the deeds mr howard my friend torrens will take my check for the two thousand oh certainly replied the venal father and to-morrow let us hope that i shall have to give you another for three thousand more added sir christopher thank heaven my check is as good as a bank-note but it wasn't twenty years ago though times have altered since then and yet as my friend howard knows i am proud of my humble origin yes yes uncle exclaimed frank we all know that perfectly but let's to business and then join the young ladies i shall make them laugh with the story of the highwaymen it's the first time in my life i was ever conquered ever overcome and now it hasn't been by fair means i remember once when i was at montreuil three french peasants had some of their nonsense with me but i just here are the documents gentlemen said mr howard frank shall conclude his story presently the agreements for the loan of the five thousand pounds were then read over mr torrens signed them sir christopher blunt wrote him a cheque for two thousand on account the remaining three to be advanced only on condition that the proposed marriage took place and thus terminated the commercial part of the business the four gentlemen then proceeded to the drawing-room where the two young ladies were seated adelaide was excessively pale and when the odious mr frank curtis tripped smirkingly up to her and taking her fair hand pressed it to his lips his breath heated with wine and rendered offensive by the fumes of the cigar steaming upon that delicate skin the maiden recoiled as if from something loathsome her father who observed her narrowly cast upon her a rapid but ireful glance and adelaide exerted herself strenuously to recover her composure like a victim about to be sacrificed at the altar of some avenging god she suffered her admirer to lead her to a seat in a remote part of the room and placing himself by her side frank curtis darted a triumphant look at howard and sir christopher as much as to say just see how successfully i am going to play the amiable in this quarter then turning towards the lovely adelaide whose large blue eyes were bent timidly down and whose bosom palpitated with a variety of painful emotions he observed in what he considered to be a most endearing whisper come my sweet gals cheer up there is nothing to be frightened at in marriage i know that i am not quite a ladies man but we shall get on better together by and by you see my dear i have always been used to manly sports or to seeking adventures where some glory was to be gained such as knocking down watchmen or fighting with highwaymen or killing my man in a duel and things of that kind but i've no doubt it will be pleasant enough to be tied to your apron string if the string itself isn't too tight adelaide raised her fine blue eyes turned them for a moment upon her admirer and then again fixed them on the carpet a profound sigh escaping her bosom at the same time but that glance so involuntarily thrown towards her companion was one of sudden curiosity as if she were anxious to discover by the expression of his face whether he were indeed serious in the insufferable rhodomontade with which he sought to captivate her 
there that's right my dear gal said curtis mistaking the motive of that rapid look which was directed towards him don't stand on any ceremony with me in a few hours more we shall be husband and wife adelais shuddered visibly ah i like this little modesty it's all very proper on your part continued the disgusting young man but it will soon wear off naturally so the young lady now started indignantly her countenance became crimson and then large tears burst from her eyes curtis caught hold of her hand but she withdrew it she literally snatched it away as if from the jaws of a hideous reptile you needn't think i'm going to eat you miss said frank in a surly tone but i forgot to tell you what an adventure i had just now with a couple of highwaymen he continued in a milder voice you see as me and my uncle and howard were coming down the lane i fell back a little just to think of you my dear at leisure when all of a sudden three chaps jumped over a bank and pointed their blunderbusses at me i didn't care a rap for that but taking the riding-whip by the thin end i knocked down three of them one after the other with the handle part you know and had just made up my mind to tackle the fourth when my horse reared and threw me for a moment i was insensible and during that time the fifth scoundrel picked my pocket of the two thousand pounds which i may call the purchase money of your own dear pretty little self sir exclaimed adelais aloud is it your intention to insult me and without waiting for a reply but yielding to the tide of anguish and indignation which now impelled her she rushed from the room rosamond who while engaged in conversation with her father sir christopher and mr howard at the other end of the room had never ceased to watch her sister with the most lively interest now immediately followed the almost heart-broken girl the moment the sisters had reached their bedchamber adelais threw herself into rosamond's arms exclaiming i will never marry him i will die sooner has he offended you inquired rosamond affectionately embracing her disconsolate sister but i need not ask your changing countenance your anxious looks your convulsive movements and then your tears while he sat by you oh my very soul revolts against him cried adelais emphatically the conflicts of agonizing emotions painfully expressed on her countenance at first when he approached me it required all the exertions of which my fortitude was capable to subdue the feelings of aversion and disgust of bitter woe and heartfelt misery with which i was agitated but when his coarse language met my ears oh rosamond exclaimed the distracted maiden i must fly i must avoid this dreadful fate or my heart will break at this moment mr torrens slowly opened the door and entered the room his countenance wore an expression which gave evidence that anger and compunction were maintaining a fierce struggle in his breast but the former feeling was rapidly obtaining the ascendancy rash disobedient girl he exclaimed fixing his stern cold eyes upon adelais who still clung to her younger sister what signifies this folly spare me spare me my dearest father cried adelais suddenly tearing herself from rosamond's embrace and falling on her knees before her sire i cannot marry that horrible man mr torrens bit his lip almost till the blood came listen to me my dear father continued the despairing girl joining her hands together while her cheeks were of marble whiteness unanimated by a tinge of vital colouring i am your daughter and must obey you but if you persist in saying receive that man as your husband it is the same as if you were to utter the word die oh no you cannot you will not sacrifice me in this cruel cruel manner what have i done to offend you that my unhappiness has become your aim dearest father relent i implore you on my knees i beseech you to save me ere it be too late adelais exclaimed mr torrens arming himself with that fatal sophistry which led him to believe that he was the only judge of what was fitting for his daughter's welfare and happiness adelais rise i command you 
the miserable girl obeyed but staggered with vacillating and irregular steps towards a chair in which she sank the agony of her soul now expelling all power of reflection from its seat i have gone too far to retreat even if i were so disposed continued mr torrens your happiness will be insured by this union her happiness father said rosamond reproachfully oh no never never undutiful girl cried the venal parent do you league with your sister against me i tell you that adelais is about to become the wife of a young man who can give her an enviable position in society and who at his uncle's death will inherit an immense fortune it is true that mr curtis is somewhat rough in manner and incautious with his tongue but perfection exists not in this world to be brief this marriage shall take place it must i dare not retract father one word more exclaimed adelais suddenly recovering her power of thought and speech those powers which anguish had for a few minutes completely subdued you are about to sell your daughter to that man he boasted to me that a few thousand pounds were the purchase money and hence my abrupt departure from the room the phrase was wrong ill-chosen coarse ejaculated mr torrens evidently smarting under this announcement but we must not judge of words themselves we must only look to the motives of him who utters them mr curtis is incapable of insulting you oh you know not how abhorrent is the coarseness of his language cried adelais bursting into a torrent of tears you provoke me beyond the limits of human patience ejaculated mr torrens stamping his foot with rage but no more of this you know my will prepare to obey it i ask you not to return to the drawing-room to-night to-morrow morning let me hope that you will show yourself a dutiful daughter towards a father who is anxious only to ensure your prosperity mr torrens then imprinted a cold kiss upon the fair foreheads of adelais and rosamond and hastily quitted the apartment for some minutes after the door had closed behind them the sisters sat gazing upon each other in the silence of painful and awful reflection yet beautiful were they in their sorrow for the unstudied attitudes and abandonment of limb which such a state of mind produces gave additional grace to the just proportions of their forms and imparted an expression of the most tender interest to the perfect composition of their features sister at length said rosamond in a soft and mournful tone as she approached adelaide what will you do this question suddenly aroused the unhappy young lady to a sense of the urgent necessity of adopting some decisive measure winding her arms around rosamond's neck she said i must fly from my father's house i must abandon the paternal dwelling oh heaven wherefore am i reduced to so fearful an alternative speak not only of yourself beloved adelais murmured rosamond chidingly for you know that my fate as well as my heart is inseparably linked with thine oh i doubt not the sincerity of your love for me dearest sister exclaimed miss torrens but i tremble at the idea of making you the companion of my flight have we not read in books dear girl that london is a dreadful place abounding in perils of all kinds and concealing pitfalls beneath its most pleasant places oh rosamond you are so young so very young to quit your father's home and venture in that great city of danger and crime but with you as my companion adelais i shall have courage to meet all those perils of which you speak responded rosamond the tones of her voice becoming so gentle so melting and so persuasive that never did she seem so dear so very dear unto her sister as at this moment and now all hesitation was banished on the part of adelais it was settled it was determined rosamond should become the companion of her flight End of section 12.